Overwhelm is not having too much to do. It's not knowing where to start. It's your world. And if you're not in control of your own world, then who's in charge of it? Who's controlling how you spend your time and how you spend your days if it's not you? Welcome to We Do Hard Things, the show about facing fears, taking big risks, and chasing down dreams. On today's show, why a primary school teacher who built a multi-seven-figure business walked away from it all, pursuing her true passion and becoming a nationally recognized productivity expert and best-selling author in the process. I don't know what comes to mind when you hear the word productivity, but for me, it just sounds like the most boring corporate subject in the world. And that's why I was so shocked, like literally shocked when I picked up the book, The Joy of Missing Out by today's guest, Tanya Dalton. Because as it turns out, productivity isn't just about getting more done in less time. It's not about setting timers and trying to cram as much as you can into a day. It's about so much more. But before we get into all of that, I have to ask you a question. How do you feel most days? Are you proud of yourself? Are you proud of what you've accomplished or do you just beat yourself up? Do you feel like you have enough time to really do things well? Or are you just bouncing, bouncing from one thing to the next? Do you feel overwhelmed by everything that you have to do, the standards you have to live up to, the goals that you've set for yourself? Because surprise, surprise, not feeling good enough, not having enough time to do the things that you wanna do, and that word, that word, overwhelm, it's become the norm. In fact, overwhelm is holding so many people back these days that, now, I mean, I didn't count, but in the book, Tanya uses it like a million times. I do use the word overwhelm a lot because I feel like if you're in this overwhelm, you're in this like tornado, you're like Dorothy in the middle of this tornado and there's all these things swirling around you and you just, you don't know where to turn or where to go. And so I say in the book and on my podcast, and I say this a thousand times in different ways, but overwhelm is not having too much to do. It's not knowing where to start. We all have a lot of things that we could do or that we have the ability to do. And so it's not the, the overwhelm doesn't come from having all those things. The overwhelm comes from feeling that tornado around us, not knowing which direction to turn in. And so I, I like to tell people, you know, we, we get caught up in those numbers of how many things are on that list or how many things we have going on in our life. And if you take 50 steps in 50 different directions, where are you going to end up? Where are you going to end up? Maybe further behind from where you were, maybe next to where you were, maybe slightly ahead. But if you choose instead to take five intentional steps, five steps where you know where to start and you know what to work on next, five steps forward, where are you going to end up? Ahead of where you started, right? So it's not about the numbers and it's not about all these things swirling around. It's really choosing where you want to start and prioritizing those things and then moving forward in that direction. It's interesting because you could trace this back to, um, you know, the need, the need to be there for people and be a people pleaser and put others yep. first. You know, I always talk, I, I, I use the word obligation so much because for me that like mm. that word speaks to so much of what I do. I feel like I need to do these things out of obligation. And my mm-hmm. wife will say like, you love doing that. And I'm like, no, I don't. I do it <laughs> because I feel like I, I, I need to do this and I'm doing it for all of you guys. She's like, no, you get up. I'm like, no, I don't. I, I just do all this stuff out no. of obligation, which is, could be shame. It could be guilt. It could like, mm-hmm. we could trace mm-hmm. this to all these different things, but it's so yeah. hard to say no. It's so hard to prioritize. It's so hard to know what is mm-hmm. the thing out of all of the things that could be the thing, which one is the thing? I call this small, huge movements because you're right. They're simple. They're small. They're easy to manage. They're easy to do. And if you do them, 
it's going to be make a huge difference. It's monumental, the difference it can make in your life. But when you distill it down to what it really is, it's insanely simple. It's not rocket science. It's choosing what is most important to you. There's a lot of power that happens inside of us when we feel like we can accomplish them. And this is why that overwhelm does the opposite. And I, I love your word obligation. I feel like just that word alone feels heavy. It feels oh, it weighted. Is. It's, it's, because it's, it is. It's oppressive. It's like, it's like, uh, like yes. you know, I, I used to work with a coach who said, no, no, you don't say you have to do it. Say you get to do it. And it's like, no. I get to pay my taxes. Wait, yeah. that didn't work. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what it's like. It's like you, you, hmm. get, you get to do your accounting. I don't like accounting. You get to yeah. clean the kitchen <laughs> or do the laundry. It's just like, it uh, doesn't work for me. Yeah. And I agree. That's the, that's the thing is there are a lot of obligations in our world and they do, they tear us into to pieces and pull us into different directions. So it really is about providing that clarity for yourself of where is it I want to go. So this idea from Tanya's book really struck me. We believe that there's a perfect system out there, that there's a system that will allow us to do more, with less, and we believe that if we can just find it, if we can just figure it out, if we can just crack the code for that perfect system, and then take ourselves and twist and turn and force ourselves into that perfect system, we are gonna get more done, we are gonna be happy, we're gonna hit our goals. All of that stuff is gonna happen. But you can only force yourself to work in a system designed by others for so long before real life really just starts to bump up against it. What The Joy of Missing Out, Tanya's book. I'm holding it up for the viewers. If you're listening, I'm holding up a book. <laughs> what it so perfectly explains is that the answer is actually to create a system for you that wraps around your quirks, that's designed for your unique likes and your dislikes and your goals and your working style and your energy levels and, and everything. But for me, when I learned that that was the answer, what I bump up against is the idea of building my entire life around me, building your entire life around you. When you're used to putting others first all the time, like so many of us are, it can make us feel like really self-centered and really selfish and even egotistical. I think you're right. A lot of people feel like, is that egotistical? And it's really, it's your world. And if you're not in control of your own world, then who's in charge of it? Who's controlling how you spend your time and how you spend your days if it's not you? We're, we're handing that over. We're, we're taking our power and we're handing it away because we feel guilty, because we're worried about what other people are going to think if we create a system around us. But if you create a system around you where you are taken care of, and I'm not saying that this means that you spend 23 hours out of the day just focused solely on you. It's really about creating this system so that you get the things taken care of that you need to get taken care of. You get your cup filled with, and when that cup overflows, it pours into everybody else. You know, I like to say, uh, you know, we can't shine our light on others if our battery needs recharging. We have to take care of us and our needs. I think the big question is, you know, when you go to bed at night, You've done a thousand things on your to-do list. You've run here and there and everywhere. You've been busy all day long. When you fall into bed at night, what is it you say to yourself? Do you say, oh, I should have done more. God, oh, why didn't I get more done? I, I failed. I didn't get enough done. Or do you end your day saying, wow, good work today. I feel amazing. Because when we chase busy, when we are people pleasing and we're taking care of everybody else's needs, we don't fall into bed at night feeling satisfied, feeling pleasantly fulfilled. And if we go to bed at night like that, how do we start our days? It becomes this drudgery, this every day of slogging through the motions. You know, I, I, I wrote um, because I, I write notes as I'm working through, um, you know, a guest's book or as I'm doing research. And I write mm -hmm. notes where I'm like, oh, there's a question here. But I also just write my own thoughts on it. And I literally wrote, so much of this book is about feeling good at the end of the day. Did you set out to, with this theme? Like, did I catch something? Because you just mentioned again, this idea like this is all a game of that moment of check-in, that moment of self-reflection. Do you feel good about what happened? 
or not? Yeah. Do you feel good about yourself or not? And is that, is that really, this is what it boils oh, down to? That is ultimately what the entire, that's what life boils down to. You know, every goal, every dream, every aspiration we have is steeped in the idea of happiness, of joy. Why do you want to lose five, 10 pounds? Cause you want to feel good going out. You want to feel happy in your clothes. Why do you want to run a marathon? So you can cross that finish line and feel the joy of, of accomplishing that, right? Why do you want to get the promotion at work? Because you want to feel that sense of satisfaction that you've climbed the corporate ladder or started your own business or whatever it is you want to do. And I think we undervalue joy. We undervalue happiness. Why? And really why? when we, why, I, this is the thing is because they're, they're soft, right? We look at, we look at numbers. How much money is in my bank account? How many followers do I have? What do my, what do my numbers say on the scale? What do we, we focus in on these quantitative numbers instead of the qualitative numbers. How do we feel? How do we, how do, how do I feel about my day? How do I feel about myself? And truly this whole idea of when your head hits the pillow, that's who you are. The rest of the world has fallen away. No one else is there. It's just the quiet stillness of the dark and the night. Who's visiting you at night? Worry, regret, stress, right? Or is it ah, satisfaction and sleep? Hmm. I think far too many of us are lying awake in bed, staring up at those red, you know, numbers on the clock and counting down, you know, oh, can't sleep. I'm stressed out. I've got all these things. And there's so much satisfaction to be had in enjoyment of life. Why hmm. are we here on this planet if it's not to enjoy ourselves? If it's not to really find pleasure in what we've been given, which is life. And so it, it does, it all goes down to how do you feel at the end of the day? If you feel good at the end of the day, life feels easier. I mean, that's the truth. Life feels hard when you go to bed and you're stressed out and you can't sleep. Life feels easy when you go to bed and you think today was good. God, I did good work today. So I went through a health challenge uh, and yeah. I've lost a total of 70 pounds. Um, wow, now I've gained, I've gained like seven pounds back uh, okay, since my well. challenge ended, but still <laughs> I've lost 70 pounds in my life. I'm pretty proud of it, but at every single step, if you asked me if I would hit my next goal, I never thought I was capable of it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I achieved it. I was like, wow, I did this. So I know mm -hmm. that there's this gap that exists between people who have done something and people mm -hmm. who have not, right? If you've lost weight, right. you know mm -hmm. you can lose weight and you know everyone right. can lose weight. But people mm -hmm. who have not lost weight just think it's not possible. It if feels like a wall. Yeah. Exactly. If you've restructured your life and you're on the other side of freedom, it's like, it's like I know this is possible and it's hard yeah. and it's scary and it's difficult, but just it's yep. so worth it. But if you're on the other side of it, you just won. You know, I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I'm too busy. Uh, maybe that's mm -hmm. good for you. You don't understand my situation. Right. Like it's just like, it I'm, just feels mm -hmm. impossible. I mean, I like to tell people I'm, I'm nothing special, right? I mean, my mom thinks I am and my husband <laughs> and my kids do, but I mean, what I've accomplished in my life, growing a seven figure business, having a best selling, but all those things, I'm just a regular person. I just made the decision that I could. Right. And so that's why I'm passionate about let's break that wall down so you can see that it is absolutely possible. We have this tendency to glom on to the negative and our brain is wired that way. It's literally designed to see the negative, because if we remember that when you touch the fire, it burns you, you're not going to touch the fire again. Right. If you learn that the saber tooth tiger is going to eat you, you're not going to go near the saber tooth tiger. So it's wired into our caveman brains to have this this look of the negative. What happens is we go through our day and in, in the joy of missing, I, I talk about this marble jar idea where this is. I'm an so idea. glad you went there because I was actually going to just be <laughs> okay. like, can you, can you explain the marble jar? <laughs> I love it. I love it. You went yes, there. <laughs> I did. We're aligned. We're aligned. Um, so I used to be a teacher and a lot of teachers do this, this idea with their classes and parents do this with their kids as well. You have this jar. And every time the kids do something good, you drop a marble in the jar. Oh, you lined up really well for recess, nice and quiet. We put a marble in the jar. Oh, the librarian said you did a great job today at library. We're going to put a marble in the jar. And all day long, we put these marbles in the jar. And when the jar fills up, we get a special treat or we do something extra with the kids, right? We have a pizza party. We do something fun like that. So we celebrate all the good we've done. I think that we, as people, have these marble jars in our head. Mm -hmm. We drop these marbles in our jar. We're like, okay, I got up and worked out. Marble in the jar. All right, I made, I made myself lunch, so I'm not gonna go out to lunch today. Marble in the jar, 
made a healthy lunch. Go ahead and put another marble in the jar, right? Did this, put a marble in the jar, marble in the jar all day long. And then something happens. We do something that isn't quite right. Maybe we forget the ingredients for dinner on the way home, or we screw up with a, a, a date for a client and we, we don't get the, the materials to them on time, something like that. Well, instead of saying, oh man, no marble in the jar. We take that jar of marbles and we loosen our grip on it and we allow it to just slip out of our hand and shatter all over the floor. Yeah. Marbles, glass are everywhere. And instead of saying, oh man, I'm going to pick up all these marbles and put them back in my jar. We forget about those marbles. All the marbles are gone. All the good we've done yeah. is gone. And all we can see is I totally failed. I did this wrong. I did that wrong. I did. This is what we do at night. We go through this whole list of what I didn't so do. I, I love this because this happened to me yesterday. So, oh, it did. so yeah. I, I did this health challenge. It ended mm -hmm. July 1st. I was, I was so good in this framework of this challenge that like mm -hmm. every single thing I ate for 120, well, for 90 days, at least was like down to the point one of an ounce. I ate when I had to eat. I, I drank what I had to drink. I, I did everything challenge over. I'm like terrible. I'm off the bandwagon. I can't stick with it. My wife's like, how could you be so disciplined and then now be such a mess? And it's just like, so yesterday we take the kids to an amusement park for the day. And it was the first mm -hmm. time this summer that we took the kids to the amusement park where I wasn't going to eat the food that was there. So I, I plan ahead, I pack ahead. Mm -hmm. So so we're sne like, like sneaking in the amusement park. Like I brought like raw broccoli and like carrot sticks. And that like, is not allowed in an amusement park for sure. Yeah, yeah. Bra brown rice, brown rice, a tomato. I couldn't bring a knife in. So I'm just like eating a tomato like an apple. Anyway, so I'm doing this stuff and all day I'm like, I'm proud. I'm on, I'm doing it. I'm doing everything. Look at I me. Do. I'm great. But then yeah. at the very end of the day, I had mm -hmm. like eaten my calories. I'd eaten my macros. And I, I over, like, I knew I was overeating and I overate. Like I, I had some extra rice mm -hmm. crackers. I had some extra natural peanut butter and everybody would be like, oh, wow. Who but like, I let myself Too down. Too many rice crackers. Look at you, terrible I know. person. <laughs> I know, but I, I let myself down and I knew I was mm -hmm. doing it and I felt terrible about it. And then I thought of your marble jar thing. And I was like, but I was good all day. And tomorrow yeah. I need to be better. Tomorrow I need to be better. But but what would normally happen is in that moment, without thinking of like all of the marbles I put in right. all day long of doing stuff, I would have normally said, I'm, I'm not, I'm terrible. Like right now I'm getting goosebumps. I'm terrible. I feel of bad course. at this. Mm -hmm. I'm terrible. I didn't do what I said I was going to do. I've let myself down. I don't have standards. I can't live up to them. What's the point? And then I would start to self-sabotage mm -hmm. and I would start to say, well, if it's, if, if I've already messed up this much, I might as well really mess up. And, yes. and if I can't mm -hmm. be good and if I can't be perfect at everything, then, then I, I deserve to like gain weight. I deserve mm -hmm. to like, mm -hmm. and then it gets mm -hmm. like really dark and negative. And so your marble oh, jar we, we thing we go was there. like we so go good. <laughs> I, I love that because the marbles are still there. Just pick them back up and put them into a fresh jar, right? I mean, we're not designed to be perfect. Perfection is not really attainable or achievable, but we set this standard for ourselves that's so high. You know, to be honest with you too, when you told me that you lost 70 pounds, what did you follow that up with? You gave I mean, me a positive. Gained, yeah, yeah. I was like, I, I lost seventy pounds, me, but I, I gained six pounds back or whatever. It was eight pounds back. You gave me, you gave me the negative because you glommed yeah. onto that negative, and it's like, okay, but still, at the end of the day, that's sixty-three pounds that you lost currently from where you were. It's not as good. I as I mean, you're winning. <laughs> Well, and that doesn't mean you're not going to get back there, but this is what we do. We, we beat ourselves up. We, we say that we're not strong enough or we're not smart enough. We're not good enough. We deserve not to be happy. All of these things. We tell ourselves these stories about ourselves that are not even true or real because all we're doing is looking at the negative. We forget about all those marbles. And I think one of the biggest lies we tell ourselves is that I'm not disciplined enough. We have this, this like, strange desire to be disciplined. Like we mm -hmm. look at other people who are disciplined and we're like, Ooh, I want that. And it makes me think about white couches, like on Pinterest <laughs> or in a catalog. Like I look at a room that's got a beautiful white couch and I'm like, Ooh, I would love that. Would I really love that? Because yeah. I have a dog. I have kids. You can only flip the cushions 
once oh, and then that's yeah. it they're done <laughs> you're, you're done like the idea of the white couch seems amazing but i would never want to live that life where i have white cushions because it wouldn't work for me and the way i really want to run my life but we think that's what we're supposed to want this is what life should look like i don't want to live in a catalog do you i mean that sounds awful no popcorn on the couch while you're watching movies no you know making forts with your kids no i mean all those things that you're gonna have to say no to that sounds awful and we look at these people that we look at who we think are just highly disciplined and they're not. There is no real willpower. That's been scientifically proven. There's no true discipline. It's just a series of habits. It's really creating, like you said there, a framework for yourself. And I, I feel like so often people feel like um, having a framework or having a system, is that gonna constrain me? Is it gonna box me in? Is it gonna make it so I can't really enjoy myself? And it does the opposite. A framework is just like the skeleton in your body. Your skeleton doesn't tell you to run, hop, skip, jump, do those things, but it allows you to do all of those things so that you can do the things you want to do. And that's what having a framework does. It almost creates this, this ability to stretch yourself and to try different things out. And so really when I talk about productivity, and I like to say that I'm redefining productivity because a lot of people think productivity is really about getting things done. It's getting more done. And it's not, it's about getting the, it's not about doing more. It's doing what's most important. Now at the top of this episode, I mentioned that Tanya built a multi seven figure business. And then she walked away from it all to pursue her true passion. That business, that first business, she actually started with $50 and with no business experience at all. You have to remember, Tanya was originally a school teacher, but her goal with this first company was to grow it to the point where her husband could quit his Fortune 500 job and come work with her side by side. That was her dream. And in 2008, she was able to make it happen. But a few years later, in 2013, she turned to him with some really big news. Well, I did, I made a huge shift. I made the decision to close down the one source of income for our family. My husband is my CMO. I'm the CEO of the company. So that was our sole income. And I made the decision to close that down to open up something that I was truly passionate about. Um, and I think for me, it really was a series of, of, of having these interactions. I was, I was doing a lot of um, business coaching at the time, helping other people understand like, how did I take $50 and grow it into this you know, big company and everything else? And, and, and these conversations, talking to these people about you choose it. This is what you choose. This is how you do. It's all about the intentionality. And when I stopped and I thought about who I was in the still darkness of the night and the thoughts that were racing through my head, I was thinking to myself things like, am I really making the impact I want? Am I really satisfied? Am I happy? Am I? And this was happening again and again and again. Is this really what I'm here to do? Or am I just doing it because at this point it's become easy? I mean, running that business became easy because all the systems were in place, everything was running. It was, it was not difficult. And I could have very easily just coasted on autopilot, but would I have been happy? No, it checked a lot of boxes, paying the bills. It, it checked the box of you know looking good on paper to everybody else, looking like a success. It, it checked the boxes of, of a thousand different things, but it didn't check the box of, is it filling my soul? Is it making me happy and making me feel fulfilled? And that's again, really soft, right? Ah, well, well, I mean, who says you're supposed to be happy? Who said, I mean, just do your work, punch the clock. And then one day you can retire and you know, then you can be happy. I'm sorry, but I don't know if you love cussing, but that's bullshit. <laughs> it really is. Um, you know, this whole idea that I can be happy someday is ridiculous. Why not be happy now? I think we spend so much time, we, we do the like 90, 95% of the things we have to do. So we hope that we can spend 5% of our time doing the things we love to do. Right. Or mm -hmm. we, we, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to spend the next three years building this thing. So that way in 10 years, I can do this thing that like, yep. Mm -hmm. Someday, so much, someday, so much time. 
So much someday. Yes. And as an entrepreneur, I totally get that. We wear a thousand different hats. So it's really easy to just keep piling more hats on and feeling like when I get this done, then I'll be happy or well, I'll be able to spend time with my kids or I'll be able to take a weekend off instead of fully unplugging. Right. All of those things we think will happen someday magically. Like what is it in the future that suddenly happens and changes? It, your future doesn't change unless you change unless you choose to change how you run your business. You know, I started running my business where I only work a four day work week and I'm off work every day at three o'clock. My team, my employees only work four day weeks, even though they get full-time pay. I can create that lifestyle for myself. I can create it for my team while running a multi seven figure business because we're doing less. We're doing the things that are truly moving the needle and making a difference. We're doing the things that ultimately make me happy. And so for me, back in 2013, I mean, people were like, were you scared to, to close your business? Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. I was scared. I mean, it was like, you know, but I was also scared of what would it look like if I stayed where I am? Am I really willing to just continue to live life on repeat or would I rather step into fear and allow fear to be my ally? And I think this is one of the, the, the mis conceptions that people have about fear. I have a whole chapter on fear in this new book because we feel like fear is the thing that's like, it's the indicator that we have to stop everything we're doing or we're on the wrong path. And a lot of times fear is actually the indicator that we're on the right path, mm -hmm. that fear and excitement manifest exactly the same in our bodies. The yeah. way you feel at the top of a roller coaster yeah. is exactly the way you feel when you feel fear, right? So you choose, are you going to feel it as excitement or are you going to reframe it, you know, or are you going to have it as fear? Which one is it for you? And if we choose to reframe our fear as excitement and look at it as this means there's possibilities in front of me, we can actually make fear our ally. We can choose a bigger fear to push against. For me, you know, when I decided to make that shift, there was the fear of what if I continue the rest of my life being unhappy and unfulfilled? What if, what if you lose everything? But I mean, that's, that's I what really the answer, lose everything. but yeah, that's, that's, fear that's is, the thing, right? The thing that pops in her head is like, I've worked this hard. I've built mm -hmm, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm, you're, I'm playing you, right? Oh, I can play yeah. me because I'm the same situation. <laughs> I'm, I'm the sole breadwinner who's been running a business for 15 years and I've got four kids and I've yeah. got a wife. And I think, what if I mismanage what if I make a bad call? What if I mismanage money? What if there's mm -hmm. a point what if, what if, where I have to turn to my spouse and say, I'm sorry, nine months ago, I thought this was a good idea and it's not working, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, and it, and it happens again because we're beautifully imperfect humans, uh, which is how we've been designed. So in, in my new book, I talk about this idea of what is the objective truth and using the scientific method to really break down your fears. Are your fears real in that, you know, you observe that you have the fear, then you hypothesize, is this really a survival fear or is this a perception fear? Survival fears are fears of death and things like that. Losing all your money, that's perception fear, right? What are other people going to think of me? What will it look like to everybody else if we lose everything? What will we do? Will we be, you know, homeless on the streets? Then you go through to so observe, hypothesize, then you experiment. What is really the worst case scenario? Truly, what's the worst case scenario? Is it that you're going to lose everything? that you're gonna be on the streets, you're gonna be homeless, and then analyze. Okay, let's go a little deeper. What, what is really the worst case, right? How, how deep can you go? Keep going deeper. Like pull out that worst case scenario and then ask yourself, analyze, is that really the worst case scenario? Would you really lose all of your money? Or do you have some savings already in place that you just conveniently forget about when this fear takes hold? Or if you needed to move back in with your parents, not ideal, but still an option. You wouldn't be homeless and on the streets, right? Your kids wouldn't go hungry. There are ways that you would, you know, your friends would come in. They would step in. Family would step in. So really analyzing what's the worst case scenario. And then is that really what's going to happen? And then make the observation. What is the truth of this matter? Well, I'm afraid to do this because I'm afraid of what people are going to think. That's the true fear, right? And when we understand that objective truth, we can take it head on. Why do I care what other people think? If there are things in this world that I can control, it is certainly not what other people think, believe, react, say, 
any of those things. And I think that when we when we strip away all those worst case scenarios and understand that they're not even really worst case scenarios, we're okay. And we can step a little more confidently into the fear and let fear help us, push us and drive us. If your fear is that you're gonna end up homeless on the street, okay, let that shark circle you. Okay, if that's my fear, how do I make sure that I avoid that? Okay, well, I need to do these things. I mean, there's nothing like being in a sinking boat to really help you prioritize. You know, we have all the things in the boat with us and we think we need all the things. As soon as we get a hole in that boat, as soon as water starts filling up that boat and it starts sinking lower and lower and lower, we, what do we start doing? Throwing things overboard. Well, suddenly all those things we had to have, we no longer need anymore, right? Yeah. So you start jettisoning them out, get them out, get them out, get them out. That's how you know what's really important. We don't have to yeah. wait for an emergency. We can just play through those scenarios in our head to clarify what is really most important and then do those things, those fewer yeah. things that are truly most important. I'm a, I'm a high level visionary kind of person. So I am, mm -hmm. I am good making like really big swings, really big changes. Yeah. Um, but they've always come to the point where I have been able to let go. Let's say, let's say a few years ago, I had to let a staff member go. And I was mm -hmm. so worried about letting the staff member go because it's like disruption to clients. And, um, and what about the team? Yeah. And what about the severance? And what about all this stuff? And so you wait and you wait and you wait and you hope to fix mm -hmm. it and fix mm -hmm. it. And then you hit the point where you're just like, listen, it doesn't, it doesn't matter <laughs> how much money this costs. It does not right. matter what my team is. It does not matter mm -hmm. if I have to close mm -hmm. my company down because of this. This has to happen right away. And once you hit that yeah. point of like, it, it, it literally, the, the outcomes do not matter. I'll deal with it later. Um, that's when you can make really bold, big decisions and I can do yes. it unemotionally and whatnot. Is there a way to shorten that gap in your experience to be able to, to, to have that courage <laughs> without, without yeah. having to wait for things to get so bad that you're literally like, listen, I'm out. I'm out if this doesn't happen. Well, I think that's why really taking the time to, to visualize and work through what is the worst case? Because if this is the worst case, what am I gonna choose in that situation? And really projecting yourself into that situation, really taking that big fear, that worst case scenario, and literally putting yourself in that situation and giving yourself, I like to call it a container. You probably heard me say that in the book several times, give yourself a container. And I call them a container because a container has a start time and an end time. So in my mind's eye, I visualize it actually as like a Tupperware. And I don't know why it's Tupperware, but it's almost like, you know, it's got these walls on the side where I'm in and I'm diving into this worst case scenario, but I have a stop time. Yeah. I have a time where I'm like, I'm not going to let this continue. I'm not going to go and I'm not going to ruminate on this for weeks or hours. I'm going to give myself 30 minutes to dive into worst case scenario. I'm going to get in that container, get myself in that hot tub of discomfort and fear, and I'm going to pop myself out of it in 30 minutes. And we're going to move on to something else. Mm -hmm. And knowing that you're, you have this container, it's kind of like that whole idea of the framework we talked about. That's achievable. 30 minutes of really ruminating on what the worst case scenario is feels like, okay, I, I can get in that hot tub, right? But you can't stay in a hot tub forever. You're going to get all pruny and gross. Um, so you got to get out. You got to give yourself that container to get out. But allowing your brain, your brain's already going wild in the hallways, going to all the dark corners and open up all the dark closets. Let it go because then it's not going to do it at other times. Give your brain permission to go to the, to the dark, knowing that you're going you're gonna to close all those doors in 30 minutes. I think yeah. that's a really helpful exercise. And I think too, reflecting back on what you have accomplished, again, back to that whole marble jar idea, what are the breadcrumbs of your past that have shown that you are able to be a success, that you can do these things? We forget about those. Those are our old marbles that have fallen on the ground, right? But when you stop and you say, well, I lose everything, you're not going to lose everything. Think of all the things you've done in the past. How many times you've reinvented yourself? How many times you have pivoted and shifted, not necessarily even just in your business, but in your personal life? Think about who you were when you were 13 versus who you were when you're 18, right? Mm -hmm. That time period is pretty ugly. <laughs> There's a lot of acne. <laughs> There's a lot of like real gangly arms and all kinds of stuff. But you get to the other side. The change is oftentimes the discomfort, but we've made changes before. We've, we've been able to, to shift and pivot and, and adjust who we are. We've evolved. We're not the same person we were five years ago or 10 years ago, sometimes not even five weeks ago. 
right? So recognizing that and realizing that, that you're just evolving and growing and that some of this changing on some of this is uncomfortable, but choosing to embrace the discomfort is really powerful. Embrace the discomfort. That is what we're all about here at We Do Hard Things. But for me, whenever I've made these types of decisions to to close one chapter in my life, to make space for the next chapter, I actually struggle to really step into it. Like, here's an example. I was at the dentist the other day and my dentist asked me what I did. Now, it would be very easy for me, very, very easy to just say like, I owned a marketing agency. We do television commercials. We've worked with the NBA. We've worked with international brands, all of that stuff. But honestly, that's what I did. That's not what my future is focused on. And so I asked Tanya, you know, when these new things are fresh and raw and we're just stepping into that new thing we're doing, when we're just starting the company, you know, you don't feel like an entrepreneur when you're just starting anything, you know, you're a performer or speaker or creator or writer, in my case, a host. It's so hard to really own that title when we feel like we're not experienced enough yet to go pro. What is a writer? Like, if you want to say that you're a writer, what's a writer? Does a writer have to have a New York Times bestselling book? No. Do they have to even have a book available on Amazon? No. A writer can be anyone who writes. We put so much weight and we, it's almost like we feel like we have to, we have to achieve some magical set of accomplishments before we can call ourselves whatever it is we want to call ourselves. Yes. We're like a damsel in distress tied up on the railroad tracks waiting we're like oh gosh waiting for someone to come and save us with their words when we have the power we have scissors in our pocket to cut that rope and free ourselves we have to choose how we want to be identified we have to choose how we want the world to see us and perceive us and this is the thing is we get frustrated as entrepreneurs when people treat us as small right oh yeah but if you are defining yourself as small you are telling them how to identify you. So A, I like to say, stop calling yourself a small business. Call yourself just a business for crying out loud. Stop using words that box you in and keep you feeling small. Use your conjunctions. Are you you a speaker or are you a highly sought after speaker? Are you, you know, uh, uh, an author or uh, a best-selling author? Are you uh, an entrepreneur or a successful entrepreneur, right? Like we choose those words. Our words have so much power and yet we don't choose to use them. We wait for other people to call us whatever it is that we want to be called, right? Someday someone's going to call me this. And then I can say, yes, well, who is this person? We don't even know who that person is necessarily, but we're just waiting for somebody else to label us. Well, choose your labels. Let other people see that you are serious about your business, that you are serious about growing your business through the words you're choosing. And these are the words we choose when we're at the dentist office. (laughs) You know, these are the words that we use when we give our elevator pitch. These are the words we choose when we fill out our social media bio. These are the words we choose when we put our profile on LinkedIn. These are words that we, we actually have ownership of those. We can choose those words. Why are we handing over that power to somebody else? If you want the world to see you as a writer, call yourself a writer. Otherwise, nobody else is. And we get frustrated and irritated if someone treats us like a hobbyist when we're like, you know what? I own a business. So you choose choose to run the company four days per week. You choose to end your workday at 3 p.m. You choose Mm -hmm. how people perceive you. You choose, uh, you know, when you answer emails or when you answer the phone or if you're available or not. It's like we just we we choose all of these things. We choose it. As soon as we realize that we have the ability to choose all of these things. Right. As soon as that like clicks in. Um, you know, it used to be for me, it was like a big thing. Um, again, health isn't the center of my world, but before March, I never did strength training in my life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and suddenly now I'm doing strength training and it's like, it's taken me so long to be like, well, to rationalize in my head. Well, I get up and I start before most people start work and before the day starts and my kids aren't awake. Mm -hmm. And so what if it takes me this time and it makes me feel better and it makes me more confident and it gives me more pride in myself. I actually like the way I look for the first time in my life and it's better for my health and I'll live longer and I get to eat. And like, I go through all of these reasons, but still some excuses that you, some days it just Uh feels like 
wouldn't those 20 hours be better used like working or hustling? You know, I'd like to say that standing tall in your power, that standing with confidence is easy. It's not. People are going to try to knock you down. People don't like it if you do something different from the rest of the herd. They don't. They, they want you to stay safe. They want you to stay comfortable. They want you to stay in your sweatpants on the couch, watching Netflix, right? Because then it also justifies how they're living as well. And your choices don't need to be justified to anybody. I would actually argue 20 hours out of the 168 hours you have every week is not that much if you really think about it. And I would also argue that you're probably way more productive because you've had that morning routine of taking care of yourself. You probably have more energy and more vitality and more just excitement. You're waking up and you're like ready to go, right? When you hit that eight o'clock, 8 30, 9, 9 o'clock time where you finished your routine, you're probably like, I feel good. Yeah. I mean, and when we feel good, we accomplish big things. You've set yourself up for success. I would say that is an absolute benefit. I would totally argue that having that routine for you is paramount in you being successful. And, now and I, I just think need you, I need look. you to record a message for me. I need you to <laughs> say, just... Hey, Mark's family and friends. <laughs> I'm yeah. a professional and this is good. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. But I, I really, honestly, if you look at a lot of um, highly successful people, Oprah Winfrey, Bill Gates, you know, all those people, they have a morning routine where they take care of their own needs. You take care of your needs because then you're better suited to take care of everything else, everything else that they throws at you. Um, I think it's really important to um, understand that we, we are in charge of our world, honestly. And that includes time. That yes, time marches on, but at the same time, we can stretch it, we can bend it, we can twist it, we can make it so it truly does work for us because it's not about getting to that destination. And that's what efficiency does. It's all about how do I get this done? How do I check this off my list, right? Effectiveness and really mastering your time is about how can I enjoy myself the most? Yeah. How can I really lean into my gifts? I've had this feeling that many, many times, you know, I've been running a business for 15 years totally just kind of overwhelmed for most of it. <laughs> um, doing, ah, doing, too, doing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> doing too much and saying yes to too much and not being very mm -hmm. good at prioritizing and all of those things. And the two feelings, one, I always feel like I flirt with greatness, but can never get there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then, and then the second one is doing too many things, but not feeling like I'm doing any of them. Well, what I'm, what I'm hoping for is I'm hoping that you're going to tell me that the answer is to just do fewer things better and that it's okay. Because that's when we're exactly hard, what I'm going to tell you. Because yeah. <laughs> when we're in the cycle of, when we're in the cycle <laughs> of it, 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 the fear is if I don't do these things, even poorly, if I don't do these right. things, that is detrimental mm -hmm. to my goals, my future, my progress, whatever it right. is. Can you build a life where you just do fewer things, but those fewer things you do they feed you and they feed your soul and you do them better. Yes. And don't worry. Life can be that way. Yeah. That's the five steps versus the 50, right? Getting closer to where it is you want to go. It is all about doing fewer things better with intention where you are truly, and I know this is kind of a cheesy saying, but finding the joy in the journey I mean, there's a reason why people say that all the time, because there is immense amounts of joy and happiness already nestled there, hidden in your day, but we're so damn busy. We miss it. We forget it's there. We don't stop to pause and just <sighs> revel in it. You know, those moments, the million dollar, you know, moments that we have with our, our family. I talk about that in the joy of missing out moments that if you don't stop and really just soak them in they'll pass you by. And if they're gone tomorrow, you're going to regret them. Moments like when you pick up your kids at carpool and they're chattering away about their day, you're going to miss that when your kid goes away to college, right? Yeah. Moments where I'm laying in bed with my husband early in the morning and we're having these conversations or we're just being together, sitting, like laying in bed side by side. If my husband was gone tomorrow and I was never able to see him again, I would pay a million dollars to get those moments back. And yet they're there every day. We take them for granted. But if we stop and recognize this is something I would pay a million dollars for if I couldn't get it, 
I mean, think about the things that we have now that we once wished for long ago, right? Yeah. We have those things now. And instead of enjoying them, instead of really just taking them in and appreciating them and having true gratitude for the journey we took to get there, to get these things, we look at them as obligations. I love it. Last question for you. For you at the end of the day, I think we may have already touched on this, but at the end of the day, it all comes down to what? How do I feel? How do I feel? How do I feel about my life? How do I feel about my relationships? I think that's really important. Um, how do I feel about how I'm choosing to spend my time? Do I feel good about it? Because if I do, that's a great day. That was a fun conversation. So I just have to throw this out there. If you like Tanya's vibe, You've got to get a copy of her book, The Joy of Missing Out. Or even better, you know, you can do what I did and just listen to the audio copy because she does an amazing job of narrating her book. Okay, three key takeaways from this conversation. Number one, how do you feel when you go to bed at night? It's the whole game. We need to spend more time putting ourselves first and less time beating ourselves up for the things that didn't go 100% according to plan. Number two, Ask yourself, are you really willing to live your life on repeat? Or would you rather step into fear, step into the unknown? I mean, that is our whole jam here. So I hope the stories that we share, including Tanya's, helps you take bold action and break out of the same old, same old. And speaking of bold action, number three, your future does not change unless you change. (laughs) Sit on that one. Now, if you have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to that little voice of fear that screams at you from the back of your mind, if that is you, you have got to face the hard things in your life. It isn't easy. It's never easy. But remember, we, we aren't just dreamers. We are doers because we do hard things. If you need a shot of inspiration, you have got to hear the story of how this woman faced cancer and a divorce and then went on to chase down her dream to be on television, which she did. Click on the video right over there to hear this real inspiring story.